All right, good afternoon, everyone. I have 325 on my clock, so let's go ahead and get started with introductions. Um, so welcome to our workshop on becoming an effective science advocate on campus and beyond. I am Sophia Casca, and I am the Manager of Science Initiatives and Outreach here at Research America, and I'll be giving you a brief overview of today's run of show, followed by introductions. So today we have four fantastic presentations lined up. After each presentation, we will have five minutes for Q&A. Following the final presentation in Q&A, we will open up the floor for additional questions and discussion. First, we will hear from Chris Jackson, uh, excuse me, Chris Jackson of Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, or ESAL, on how to engage locally in policy and advocacy. Then we will dive deeper into engaging locally through the formation of a university science policy group with a presentation from Aaron Reagan from the National Science Policy Network, or more commonly referred to as NSPN. Then to give everyone examples of programs you can develop and execute locally, we will hear from two student advocacy groups. These groups recently completed Research America's Civic Engagement Microgrant Program. We hope these will provide ideas for your programs that you can conduct in your own policy and advocacy groups. We will hear from Julia Leffler and Dan McCallie, who will tell us about their newly formed group at the Medical University of South Carolina called South Carolina Policy Engagement Advocacy and Research or SC pair. Last but not least, we will hear from Joanne Lai at the University of California, Irvine, who will tell us about her workshop series on data visualization and communicating science to the public and policymakers. I will now turn this over to Jenny LaRay, Vice President of Strategy and Communications at Research America, who will be moderating this session. Thank you, Sophia. And thanks to all of you who are joining us. I hope you've enjoyed other aspects of the conference today. Um, we have such a great panel. Um, we're going to start off with Chris Jackson with ESOL. And I just want to give a plug. I think ESOL is such an amazing organization. You know, it's mainly run by volunteers. It's a great example of what you can do as a professional scientist in your local community. Um, and it's really been a pioneer in the, in the science, um, science policy advocacy space. So Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks Jenny for that introduction. Thanks Research America for having us. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Chris. I'm, I'm speaking today on behalf of engineers and scientists acting locally, which um, as was just mentioned, is an entirely volunteer run um, nonprofit that focuses on um, providing resources and um, encouraging scientists and engineers to get involved in science policy um, right in their own communities. Um, we really encourage this idea that you don't need to necessarily go to Washington DC or to be at any particular career stage um, to become a science policy advocate where I think you can do so right now, right in your community. And hopefully um, over the next couple of minutes or so, I can provide you some examples and some of the tools and the ways that ESAL um, will enable, um, enables folks to do just that. Um, so without further ado, let's dive on in. Um, and one of the core reasons that ESAL was founded, one of the reasons we exist and one of our driving um, mottos is really this quote right here, that decisions are made by those who show up. Um, this is attributed to unknown. If any of you are West Wing fans, you might've heard it on there before, um, but this really is an important idea in science policy and science advocacy, and particularly at the local level, where as many of you are aware, I'm sure a lot of oxygen in the room tends to get drawn to maybe Washington DC or policy making that's happening at the national level. But there's equally important, if not more important policy decisions that drastically impact people's lives that happen at the very local level. And unfortunately, the people who tend to make decisions at the local level are not always representative of community members um, just because of the lack of engagement or the lack of knowledge around ways to get engaged at a local level, which is where ESAL comes in. And we further, you know, first part of our name, engineers and scientists acting locally, um, we really believe that a lot of these decision-making processes could benefit or do benefit significantly by having the voices of scientists and engineers who bring that, you know, data-driven, hypothesis-driven, um, type of mindset and approach to policy making decisions. Um, so we really um, want people, scientists and engineers like many of y'all on the call here um, to get more involved locally. 
And one of the re reasons we are founded and one of the reasons we focus on this area in particular is we did a civic engagement survey back in 2017 when our organization was first being founded. And we asked you know, a wide variety of scientists and engineers from across the country really, you know, are you interested in becoming involved in your local, um, which we are gonna define as you know, city, regional, state government. And overwhelmingly, you know, as you can see from the data right here, um, a large majority of them said yes or maybe, right? Um, so there's definitely a clear interest in getting engaged locally. However, when we asked a follow-up question, you know, in terms of action, have you actually been engaged in whatever level of government? As you can see here at the federal level, that response still was relatively strong, right? Pretty much anyone who was interested was equally um, engaged at the federal level, but that number steadily drops down as you go down to the state, um, regional, and municipal levels. Um, so there really is this gap between interest and action and local engagement, which is exactly the void that ESAL works to fill. So I've said this a number of times and I'll continue to say it throughout kind of my presentation, but what do I mean when we're talking about local government? And when ESAL talks about local government, we think about anything um, below the state level. So I'm based in California, so this is a little biased towards the California um, perspective, um, but this can really apply to you know, wherever you are located um, in the country around the world even. Um, and kind of to give a very high level overview of what are the types of um, engagement opportunities or the types of people and offices you might be engaging with at these different levels. Um, at the state level, um, which many people I'm sure are familiar with, we have the governor's office, you have a state legislature, and there's a kind of a wide variety of departments and ag agencies, advisory boards and commissions, and working groups that can span, you know, a wide variety of different issues um, from everything from wildfire advisory to um, health to issues that in California are, you know, garnering a lot of attention these days. Um, at the one level below that, at a level that folks are maybe um, typically one of the levels that we find people are the least knowledgeable about is the county level. And counties are an agglomeration typically of you know, a regional um, jurisdiction or maybe a couple of cities within an area um, where there's another layer of departments and agencies, perhaps county commissions, and in particular um, some of the commission levels that occur at the county level that um, maybe people have been more familiar with over the past year, public health commissions and election commissions, which as we know, play a key role in many local decision-making policies, but um, quite frankly, many, many people are just unaware of. Um, as we get down to the city, this is where we see um, city level um, structures of government, whether it's the mayor's office, the city council, departments and agencies again, and then kind of at the neighborhood level, there's neighborhood commissions, community response teams. And in particular for this audience, I wanna highlight that we also consider that universities are a form of local engagement. Um, so if you're a graduate student, I'm still a graduate student myself. Um, if you're um, a student at a university or if you're working as faculty or staff at a university, um, there's a myriad of kind of ways you can engage at that very local level um, that can have a, um, a largely disparate impact um, on kind of your local community. So this is kind of to give you a high level overview of some of the different types of structures of local government. And then when we think about local government, and local issues, maybe you're thinking, okay, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, what are the types of issues that I could perhaps bring expertise to or could engage in? And there's, this is more than we can go into in this um, brief section, of course, but just to give you a high level kind of glimpse at what local STEM issues could be, everything from infrastructure um, to a large amount of health um, and disparities, um, to anything from environment to education. All of these are, of course, national, international issues that get, are getting a lot of attention these days, but a lot of their implementation of policies as well as the development of particular policies that are tailored to your individual community happen at the very local level. Um, so all of these are issues that, again, could benefit from um, hypothesis-driven driven, evidence-based kind of policymaking um, and really that level of um, expertise that scientists and engineers, we believe, can really bring to the table. Um, so we encourage um, you to, you know, take a look at this um, and kind of look in your community and see where the, your interests align with the needs and kind of use that to get engaged. And once you've kind of found that opportunity, again, one of the biggest challenges for scientists and engineers engaging locally is really taking that first step. It's being able to identify, um, okay, I'm interested in science policy. I'm interested even more so in local engagement, making a difference in my community, um, but I just don't know where to start, right? There's so many opportunities. There's so many different things um, and it's a bit overwhelming. So at ESA, we really like to uh, break it down and make it as simple as possible for you with a lot of our resources, which I'll get into momentarily. Um, but really taking that first step we have found is that key barrier to get started. Um, so we've kind of a couple of different ways that you can 
take that first step is starting with an idea, right? Maybe that last slide that I showed with all those different kind of local STEM issues has sparked an idea or maybe something based on your research or a need that you've identified in your local community just as a resident, um, which we'll get into an example momentarily. Um, an idea can spark be the first step in kind of taking your local engagement, whether that's, okay, I've noticed there's um, issues with transportation in my community or Maybe there's a natural resource that's um, particular, there's an issue that's arised around there that I might be able to contribute to. Another opportunity to take that first step, right? Maybe once you've had an idea or maybe if you don't even have an idea yet, but you're just broadly interested in getting engaged locally is to think about doing your research, right? Research a policy or initiative. And that can be anything from um, reading up on a topic, maybe in um, more academic literature or kind of engaging at it at the very local um, level and seeing what's actually happening right now in my community in regards to this issue. So that might mean watching a public meeting or kind of looking around and networking with another local advocacy group because they're most likely, if this is an issue that you're passionate about, there's most likely other people in your community who are also passionate about it and there might already be grassroots organizations working on it. So you really encourage folks to um, find the other people in their community and work with them um, so that we're not over duplicating efforts. Next step, right? getting into the kind of the meat of it, thinking about advocacy, there's a, a lot of different ways that you can take the first step in advocacy, whether that's meeting with your local representatives and government staff, either at you know the city, county, or state level, as I mentioned before, um, supporting local ballot measures if we're in an election year, writing an op-ed, or giving public comment or expert testimony, which I'll talk about in a bit momentarily. And if you're interested in kind of more long-term service, maybe you've done some of these other ones before and you're thinking about um, upping your engagement level, um, thinking about long-term service in terms of joining a board or commission in your community, advising an election official, maybe creating, developing some more relationships there, or even running for office yourself. Um, and ESAL has, um, can connect you with many folks who have done um, all of these different things and provide some examples. Um, so I'm just gonna give you uh, that kind of high level overview um, there's a lot and it can be hard to conceptualize, you know, where can I particularly plug in? So I'm gonna give you kind of two examples of folks, um, engineers and scientists who we have connected with um, at ESAL to help maybe make it a little more um, real. And that's part of a lot of what ESAL does. We run our blog series, um, which where we feature um, organizations and individuals who have engaged locally to put a face to kind of a lot of these actions. And two of those faces um, are Catherine and Mary. So they're both bioengineering PhD candidates at Rice University. Um, in addition to kind of their um, bioengineering background and really great research that they do, um, they also are avid bikers. Um, and so taking this aspect of their kind of life, um, they were spurred to act when after two cycling deaths that occurred near um, an intersection on near their campus. Um, and they were, they as you know, avid bikers, as community members, this really concerned them. And they were thinking, you know, how can we become engaged to you know, mitigate this problem? How can we make this intersection and the transportation system in our own community um, safer? So um, taking you know, that scientific, uh, that STEM background, that engineering background, that training that they had, they went out and did what any good scientist or engineer does. They went out and gathered some data um, to answer the question. So how did they do that? First, they attended city council meetings um, to kind of listen in and say, okay, this is an issue, right? Obviously there's other community members who are equally concerned about these cycling deaths in our community um, and kind of listen to what the discussion is. And what they've kind of found out was there were a lot of people who are concerned, yes, but none of them were presenting, you know, really any hard data. No one had any concrete evidence on what's the best path forward to fix it is, right? We all identified this as a problem, but none of them really were coming up with concrete solutions. So they kind of gathered data. They went out and did, you know, some really basic data gathering. They went out and kind of, you know, thought about how long does it take people to actually cross this intersection? Um, how long do the traffic signals currently run right now? Um, what are the, what's the signage situation like? Why are these um, traffic deaths occurring? And so based on their findings, um, they went and they gave public comment at a city council meeting and said, hey, we're members of the community and here's what we have found. Um, as a result of kind of this advocacy, they were able to implement real changes in their community. You know, to, to a lot of the things that I just mentioned, changing the signal timings, increasing crosswalk visibility and increasing the signage around that intersection. Um, so this is a really great example of two folks who have taken kind of their technical background and really applied it to a local issue. Um, and you know, they continue to advocate and develop relationships around the city of, um, to, around you know, safety and public health at the, the local and at the state level. So this is a really great example of um, kind of engaging locally and how you can have a real impact on your community. 
Another example I wanna give um, is of Nilesh. Um, he is a little bit later stage in his career. Um, so he holds a MD, he's board certified in internal medicine. And he started out, um, or one of the early stages of his involvement in science policy actually took place at the federal level. He was a formal AAAS, he's a former AAAS fellow at the National Institutes of Health in DC. Um, so after he kind of concluded that work at the federal level, um, he decided he wanted to um, kind of work a little bit more locally. And he served as the chief health officer at a nonprofit in Maryland that focused on healthcare um, and housing for over 10,000 unhoused people or so. Um, and following that in 2019, um, he was appointed um, as a county health officer in Anne Arundel County. Um, and his job here kind of operates on a variety of different levels, which makes it particularly interesting for um, anyone who's interested in a local engagement. Um, it involves direct service at the local level, which um, you can, we can all imagine what that looks like, especially among COVID um, now, but you know, particularly understanding the needs of his community and delivering preventative services. Um, um, but also at the same time, as a county health officer, he's also um, tasked with interacting and advocating at the state level um, for the needs of his community. So he op kind of operates on multiple levels of that local engagement spectrum that we talked about. Um, a lot of his focus um, is on disease prevention, so, you know, um, intervention before and um, kind of understanding health outcomes and understanding um, underserved communities and how to allocate resources to address the health inequities that exist at those levels. Um, so when ESAL interviewed him for a blog, which you can check out the link on the screen, um, we spoke to him in May um, 2020, which is perhaps one of the most challenging times to be a local um, health officer. So uh, as COVID was rapidly spreading around the country. Um, so he really emphasized that his STEM background um, was critical in kind of parsing through that kind of vast amounts of data that was coming out at that time. And you can still continues to be invaluable to him as they continue to um, understand, you know, what is the data we're looking for? What are the trends? Um, and what are kind of the ways that we can improve, directly improve health outcomes in the local community? So that's just a great example. Um, Again, as someone taking his technical background um, and you know, even with federal experience, really thinking about how he can be an advocate at the very local level um, to even address in times of crisis um, or more broadly to address health disparities in his community. Um, so if you're interested in kind of either of those opportunities, I've offered kind of two examples, one um, from Catherine and Mary about how they delivered public comments and engaged at the very city level. Um, and then Arun, uh, um, Nilesh, sorry, who um, engaged at the, um, county level. And ESAL provides step-by-step -step engagement guides, um, which we call our local engagement playbook, to help you navigate these spaces and engage um, in these ways. Um, so in particular, um, we have our one playbook on delivering public comments, which is exactly what Catherine and Mary did. And we walk you through, you know, what is the purpose of this? What are the main outcomes that you might expect from this level of local engagement? And here's really, we break it down concretely in a step-by-step -step guide. Here are the five or six um, pretty basic steps that you can take um, to engage at that level. So I'm not gonna go into those in detail today, um, but we have two examples here, delivering public comments, um, joining advisory board or commission. You can check them out online along with more examples of scientists and engineers who have engaged locally in this way, as well as a whole host of other playbooks um, that we offer, which um, are right here. Um, we offer our playbooks are divided into about three different categories or so, um, which break down um, somewhat to the um, taking that first step slide that I showed originally, um, whether you're interested in just learning more about ways to engage locally or learning about local issues in your community, um, whether you're interested in meeting um, with your local representative or, or local policymakers or other people in your community who might be similarly passionate about advocating for science and technology um, policies, or whether you're ready to take that next step and to, um, actually act um, in a kind of a variety of the different ways that we've shown. So we have examples, again, examples and step-by-step -step guides for a lot of these different um, playbooks here as well. So I encourage you to kind of check those out um, and continue to really take that first step to get engaged locally. A little bit more about engineers and scientists acting locally. If you're kind of, this has really piqued your interest in local engagement, we offer a whole host of um, Resources that I've touched on briefly here, including our blog, which I touched on our, two of our stories from the field um, um, with Nilesh 
and Catherine and Mary talking about featuring people who have engaged locally. We also have our local STEM series um, which features organizations as well as postcards which are with shorter snapshots of folks who are engaging locally um, as well as deep dives that dive into particular topics. We have a couple interesting ones um, coming that are already out and a few more that are in the works. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for those. Um, we host a variety of events, um, all virtual these days. Um, we have a two-part series on science, STEM education coming up in July. Um, so keep an eye out for those if you're interested, as well as we'll be at a host of different conferences this fall. And we offer um, workshops as well, tailored workshops for if you are part of any particular group that's interested in maybe increasing your local engagement or tailoring your science policy advocacy um, for the local level. We're happy to work with you and provide some tailored workshops um, to help you engage at that way. So feel free to um, reach out if that's of interest, as well as all of our other resources. I mentioned our local engagement playbook. You can check out our local STEM database to look for organizations near you that might be engaged in STEM at the local level or add your own organizations if you're um, interested as well. So that kind of is the gamut of resources that ESAL offers. Um, I'll leave you with, um, we are currently um, we are entirely volunteer run. You can see our team here. We are actually actively recruiting for volunteers. So if you're interested in you know, taking that next step and learning from a variety, a lot of our members have um, you know, federal science policy experience or a lot of them are as well, our early career. Um, there's stairs, we have a wide variety of um, people you can meet and network with. So if you're interested in getting involved, we currently have openings on our web team um, for virtual event coordinators and writers for our blog. So kind of spanning a large gambit of what we do. Um, so if that interests you at all, um, feel free. You can either reach out to me or um, kind of look at the job postings, launch your postings on our website. And with that, um, thanks all for your attention. Um, you can subscribe to ESAL's newsletter um, there. We get our monthly newsletter if you're interested as well as check out all of our social media. And thanks for your attention. Thanks, Chris. Wow, that was really terrific. Um, it was so comprehensive that I think you you answered all the questions I had. Um, but I will just start with one, um, which is um, we've seen a, an increase in interest in our micro grant program among early career scientists. Have you also seen an increased interest in working locally among um, engineers and scientists? I.e., has your organization grown? over the last few years? Absolutely, so I joined the organization back in um, 2000, I guess it was 2017, 2017 or so, so about you know, three or four years ago now. Um, and the team was about 10 people then. Um, as you can saw from that last slide, we've kind of grown exponentially in that time. And I think that definitely that the interest in local engagement has grown and groups you know, who have done Research America microgrants or other microgrants made through the Union Concerned Scientists or through NSPN. Um, a lot of those microgrant programs are focused on local issues. They're interested in you know, advocating in their state legislature. They're interested in you know, creating programs in their own community. And I think increasingly people are realizing, you know, um, I don't have to fly to DC to meet with my Congress person um, to advocate for science policy. There are these issues in my local community that I am particularly passionate about that impact me on a daily basis um, that I want to get involved in. So I think it's great. Um, I think the more scientists and engineers we can encourage to, you know, think about, you know, what is my city council doing? What is my local health commission doing? What is my environmental commission doing? And where can I plug in? The more we can encourage folks to think about those opportunities for engagement, the better. That's great. If folks have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Or you can also just speak up because we are a fairly small group. Okay, Ben. Um, ben asks, um, you referenced the many different levels of local government. How many of these tend to have science advisors and how can we find out where the decisions are made? Great question, Ben. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I was actually involved in some um, back in 2018 at the California state level, there was talk of creating a specific science advisor to the governor. And I would say that that's rare. Um, I'd say a lot in a lot of these local government situations, you're not gonna have something like OSTP rarely. Um, California is a bit unique in that we do have some different bodies that um, support science and technology specifically, um, but just because it's not explicitly laid out that you know this is a science advisor or something like that, um, 
doesn't mean that those people don't exist. I think especially, um, definitely not enough. Um, I mean, I was gonna say that there's not enough science technology people involved in local um, areas, but I think definitely as, as you get into a lot of these more technical commissions, right? Your public health commission, your environmental commission, a lot of those bodies are probably gonna have scientists and engineers working in them um, directly, even PhD level scientists and engineers. Um, and so that's definitely, um, there's definitely those people there and they're more than happy more often than not to you know, work with other um, STEM professionals who are interested in engaging and kind of finding out where those decisions are made. Um, I think that you can navigate, um, like looking, for example, looking at, if you're thinking about engaging at your city level, go to your city council's website and look at their meeting minutes, see what the issues that they've been talking about in the last couple of meetings are. And that'll give you a good sense of the, maybe what they're talking about, maybe what they're not talking about um, where you might want to raise issues. Terrific. Um, Anthony wants to know, um, and actually this was something that um, I thought it would be helpful to, to explicate a little bit more, is how do you find out who is already doing some form of advocacy in your community if you want to get involved? Do, does ESL um, maintain any kind of database of members and um, around the country of projects? Yeah, so our local STEM database does this to some extent. So that highlights all the local organizations that we featured on our blog, as well as some others, um, as well as sometimes people. We're kind of working on, behind the scenes, we're working on revamping that now. So hopefully to be able to be a little bit more accessible. Um, I know there's other organizations um, that host, we don't necessarily host a membership database right now. Um, but I think if you're interested in doing it, there are great resources, um, like you have concerned scientists or advocacy groups like that as well as if you just go to these public meetings, for example, if you go to your city council meeting, if you go to the public meeting of your energy commission, and listen to who are the other people who are giving public comments, who are the other people who are regularly attending and kind of talking with them and finding out um, that can be a great way to get plugged into those communities. So Paulina, not to put you on the spot, but um, would you ask your question because um, I was having a little trouble um, kind of getting to the key point that you wanted to raise um, in what you wrote in the chat. Okay, hello everyone. I am from Mexico and I am a, uh, an English native speaker. Uh, I, I, I am happy to be here with you because here in Mexico, we don't have as many initiatives for engaging with the government as a STEM student. I am a recent PhD graduate from biotechnology. And I am really interested in uh, forming this bond with government and uh, that decision-making is based on science, scientific um, data. And my question is, do, do you as a group of students uh, are searching these uh, areas of opportunity to approach the government or do you have someone from the government that uh, allows you to or, or tell you how to approach the, 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 these areas in the government or how do you do that? Thanks, yeah. Paulina. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> great you. question. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I would say that um, while well, I'm not an expert um, necessarily in the region where you're from uh, in engaging there, I would say if you're at a university or a recent graduate of a university, a lot of universities have government and community relations offices. So a lot of them are going to work with the local government in some form. So kind of finding out who that is at your home university and working with them can be a great avenue. And kind of keeping in mind that, you know, technically, right, whatever local government or region you're part of, they're they should be interested in you kind of as a resident of that community, as someone, I don't know, tech, presumably a voter, um, that they should be interested in what you have to say. Um, so kind of finding, again, kind of finding that niche in terms of um, if you're interested in a particular issue, okay, find out who makes the decisions around that particular issue. And then um, think about, you know, seeing if you can schedule a meeting with them or um, just to learn more about what they do and then see how you can go from there. And really a lot of local, a lot of advocacy, but especially advocacy at the local level is so much driven by relationships. Um, a lot of it is relationship building and a lot of the 
tasks we talk about, you know, giving public comments, that's not intended to be give public comments once and expect you know, everything to get fixed. It's, you know, deliver public comments again and again, and then maybe someone on the council recognizes you. And then they say, hey, there's an opening on this commission. That's how a lot of people tend to get involved on local engagement. If you read kind of our blog, that's how a lot of the people we feature kind of have snowballed into becoming more and more involved in their local community because um, they kind of take that first step and, you know, people are eager to have, you know, scientists and engineers kind of speaking up and playing more of a role in local government. Thank you very much. Um, are you finding that over time you're actually getting requests from government agencies who are looking for expertise? And is that yeah. kind of part of what you're trying to build as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can give an example of Arti Garg, who's our founder. Um, she um, is based in Hayward, California, and she originally kind of started out with what I was just describing. She was giving, um, she did a AAAS fellowship. She's a physicist by training, data scientist um, in her day job now, but she was giving comments at her local um, Hayward City Council meeting. And, you know, she gave public comments frequently enough and then, you know, council members started to recognize her and then, you know, hey, asked her, hey, I noticed you advocate for a lot of, you know, these types of issues. Are you interested in serving on our Keep Hayward Clean Commission? Um, she was recently asked to, you know, serve on um, a policing task force to reimagine what policing looks like in the city of because we recognize, they recognize that, hey, you are an outspoken member of our community. You ask, you know, thoughtful, well-informed questions and you're kind of the kind of person that I would want to be representing my community members. So it's really about developing those relationships uh, more so than advocating for any particular issue in my mind. Chris, what a fabulous presentation. The slides will be available to everybody. Um, and I know Chris will be happy to be a resource. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I already knew a lot about ESOL, but I, I learned even more. So keep up the really terrific work. Um, okay, our next so speaker is Erin Reagan from NSPN. And NSPN is also a very unique and forward-thinking organization in terms of um, science policy activism on campus. And they are kind of an umbrella group of chapters all across the country, which you'll hear about. And they've been doing more and more in terms of training uh, and capacity building of students who are interested in science policy. And we work very closely with them. So Erin, take it away. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about NSPN and also about um, some of the, the more local science advocacy, uh, which was mentioned before, starting a science advocacy organization at your institution. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of my background in this work, and then I'm going to give you all sort of a primer of the things that you need to think about and the types of decisions that you would have to make to start an organization like this. So I am the president of my own science policy organization, the Penn Science Policy and Diplomacy Group. It's a student group at the University of Pennsylvania where I'm a PhD candidate. And our mission is to create hands-on opportunities for STEM trainees at Penn in science policy, science diplomacy, and science communication. When I took over in 2018, it was really just me and one or two other people who were enthusiastic but didn't really know anything about any of those topics. Um, now in 2021, we have over 400 returning members, um, over 60 student organizers who work with us and about 20 members of our leadership team. I'm also, as was mentioned, a member of the National Science Policy Network. Uh, NSPN is a nationwide nonprofit, and our mission is to catalyze the engagement of early career researchers in policymaking by fostering community, training the next generation of leaders, and empowering advocates for the role of science in society. We have a lot of different types of programming, but most of them are related to training like workshops and seminars, as well as opportunities to apply the things that you've learned. Uh, and we have many different branches, but just a few of them are work in science diplomacy, uh, graduate education policy, science policy, advocacy, communication, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as many others. Uh, and a significant component of our work is supporting early career researchers and student science policy groups, which I'll get into a little bit more. 
Uh, I, over the last year, have had the pleasure to lead the Eastern Hub of NSPN, and a big component of that job was supporting the creation as well as the growth and sustainability and the impact of science policy student groups in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic United States. So here are some of the things that I've learned through NSPN and also my own personal experience starting and building a science policy group. So the first thing that you're probably going to want to do is build your team. And there are a couple of different ways that you can structure the organization. I'm not going to go into a ton of details, but the two main options are horizontal and distributed. For a horizontal organization, it's sort of like a board of directors where everyone shares responsibility. And then when a new opportunity comes up, like somebody proposes that we host an event, the people who take on that responsibility um, are determined based on who is interested and who has the availability, like the time commitment that it would require to put that together. The other main alternative is a sort of distributed model where you have individual leaders who specialize in specific areas, like having a chair of social programs and a chair of professional development programming, for example. Both of these models have their own pros and cons, and so you just have to think about which one is a better fit for your organization and for the people that you are working with. It's important to note, though, that regardless of what you choose, a lot of different applications are going to require that you have both a president and a treasurer officially, uh, either for your university to recognize you or for you to accept grants from other organizations and things like that. So once you've decided on what sort of structure you want to have, you need to recruit your team. When you're just getting started, probably the best way to start uh, is by identifying potential collaborators by their bandwidth and their interest in the mission. And you should consider that because you're so brand new, you might want to be open to suggestions on exactly what that mission should be. How broad should it be? Uh, how much should you try to incorporate? And how targeted is your mission going to be? In terms of where to look for these people, one of the best places to look is amongst your friend group, because you probably have friends who are interested in some of these issues too. Uh, the people that you get into passionate political debates with are often good people to pull from, but you can also ask your friends if they know anybody who might be interested in starting a group like this. You can also look on social media, either by posting or by following hashtags that are related to the topic that you wanna focus on and looking for people at your institution who are posting about those things. You can also look at other student groups uh, who have sort of an overlapping mission with your mission and ask if they would be willing to send an email to their membership on your behalf. And of course, if you're affiliated with an institution, all of your departments and programs are going to have their own listservs. And so you can request that they send out recruitment emails or uh, let people know about an upcoming kickoff meeting or something like that. Once you're sort of off the ground and you have things moving a little bit, you're going to want to look for potential leaders from within your program and event participants. There are a lot of things that you might want to look for when you're considering future leaders, but of all the different characteristics, the most important one I have found is sustained interest. So somebody who is on their own without prodding from external places, coming to your events, participating in your programs, they're self-motivated, they seem to really care about this type of work. Once you've identified people like that, you should reach out to them, get to know them a little bit, understand what is driving their involvement. Are they thinking about maybe doing a career in science policy, or is this a hobby that they're really passionate about? Once you understand where they're coming from and why they're here, you can look for opportunities for them to volunteer or be a leader in your organization that suit their needs and their interests. So if you have a working group to put together a workshop that is looking for an additional person, reach out to them and say, hey, we have this opening and I think you'd be a really good fit. Would you be interested in participating? That is the most successful way that we have had of recruiting additional people. So once you have your team, you have to start putting together your programming. There are a lot of different ways to do this. The most important thing is that you are intentional about what you want people to get out of it. So if you want people to come out with a new skill they didn't have when they arrived, you might want to go with something like an interactive workshop. But if you're interested in introducing your participants to something they've never seen before, maybe to a new career path or a totally new topic, 
maybe something a little bit more like a lecture style, one directional information transfer would work better. If you're looking for an opportunity for people to apply things that they already know, you might want to go with something a little bit more hands on more of a project based type of program. Once you've figured that out, if you're doing either an educational or skill building format, you probably are going to want to figure out how to generate the content for this event. So there are two ways to do this. One, you identify an external speaker who's qualified to speak on your topic of interest, and then you invite them to come in. Um, importantly, when you're identifying these people, don't only consider how qualified they are, because you might find somebody who is eminently qualified with 30 years of experience, but they're not interested in collaborating with you because they don't have the time to make something that is tailored for your goals. So it's important to balance somebody's qualifications with how much time they can give you to really tailor what they'll be providing for your audience and for your goals. The other option is that you can do it in house. This can be a little bit intimidating, especially when you're new, but I promise you don't need 30 years of experience to put together a workshop on a topic. We have had a lot of experience now with recruiting volunteers who have no exposure to the topic, giving them a month or two to research it on their own and present to each other what they've learned and then put together a workshop with just what they've learned over the last two months and uh, it's gone really well. We've done that now several years in a row because it works out so well. It's a great experience for the people who come to the event. It's also a great experience for the people who are on the team putting together the workshop. They learn much more than they would have just having attended something else. So those are two options. And depending on your goals and your timeline, you can figure out which one works best for your situation. Once you've done that, you have to figure out advertising because Putting together an event and having nobody come to it is a huge bummer. There are a lot of ways to do this and creativity is great. Absolutely think outside the box. One of our best fallbacks is university-based listservs. Anything that's run by your institution, it might be for your department or for your program, for the entire school maybe. Um, that's definitely a great way to do it. Uh, you can also, and I highly recommend this from the beginning, start putting together your own listserv that people can join at the end of your events or they can join from a website or something. Uh, this way you can have your own in-house listserv to send to everybody who's interested in the work that you do. And you won't be so dependent upon working through administrators and other external places whenever you have something to advertise. You can also use social media. This works really well for virtual events where people just have to register for something online and they don't have to be physically present to participate. And of course, word of mouth. This is, uh, I think, really underrated, especially when you're brand new because you don't have that name recognition yet on campus and it can be really powerful to have somebody say, hey, I'm going to this event later, do you wanna come? Um, that's definitely how we got our first crop of really committed members. So I really highly recommend that as well. And of course, the final step, whenever you do something, you should evaluate it. Uh, what went well? What can we learn from in the future? How can we do things better next time? Um, you should spend some time thinking about this yourself, but you should also create space for other people to give you constructive feedback, um, not just from the other leaders who helped put it together, but any volunteers who helped you make it happen, as well as the participants. So you can make surveys if you want, or you can just ask people informally. You can send your friend an email if you know that you, they came to an event that you put on and ask them what they thought. Um, and always be willing to take what you learn and then incorporate it into the thing that you're gonna do next so that you can always be growing and building. Okay, so funding is a fantastic resource, but you don't need it to do a lot of things. Uh, it can be helpful. So there are some things you can do with it and some things you can do without it. Things that you can do with funding are pay speakers an honorarium. Some speakers are gonna require that you pay them an honorarium. Some speakers are not. It's recommended that if you're bringing in any underrepresented speakers that you do pay them an honorarium to compensate them for all of the time that they put into preparing for that presentation that they gave you. You can also, if you're doing something in person, purchase food which can be a really big draw for attendance, especially when you're new and you're just trying to get your name out there. I will note though, just because somebody comes to your event and there is food there, doesn't mean that they are going to stay in your organization. Um, so you can get a big draw, but then it doesn't help as much with retention. 
It can be good though to get people in the room to hear your message and then find out, you know what, I am interested in science advocacy now that you mention it. Um, another thing that you can do with money that is really powerful is reimburse travel. So this can be great for if you want your members to attend a conference of some kind like the AAAS meeting uh, or the NSPN symposium. Also very helpful if you're doing Hill Days either in DC or at your state legislature or your local city legislature. Um, this can be really powerful for people who are unable to attend on their own dime. Um, you can also do field trips. And if you're bringing in speakers physically from another place, you can use these funds to uh, pay for their transportation, their train tickets and flights and things like that. That being said, you don't need money to do really high quality programming. So if you don't have money, you can bring in speakers who don't require an honorarium. You can also bring in speakers that you wouldn't be able to pay to physically bring to campus. This is especially powerful if you're looking to bring in people from other countries, uh, which used to be really difficult, but now with Zoom, you can just have them do something over Zoom. You of course can also host virtual events because they don't require food. And finally, you can also do project-based programming. There are a lot of options here and none of them really require any money. So things like memo writing campaigns, op-ed writing campaigns, uh, internships that you put together with local nonprofits or with uh, local representatives, all of these things you don't need funding for. If you do decide to do programming that requires money, there are a lot of options. You can do internal funding, which is usually from within your institution. There are student governments and sometimes postdoc organizations that have funds discretionary that you can apply for. You can either check their website or you can email their treasurer to figure out the deadlines and process. Most departments and programs also have funds set aside for professional development. And most of the work that you're gonna be doing in science policy and advocacy is gonna count as professional development. I'd recommend you reach out directly to the chair of these different programs and departments to figure out what is the process for getting this money and are you eligible for it? Some institutions also have interdepartmental or presidential funds. These tend to be a lot more money and a lot more paperwork, but they can be really powerful if you get them. And of course, outside of your institution, there are a lot of external sources of funding. One of them, of course, is the National Science Policy Network. As I mentioned before, we spend a lot of our time supporting the work of early career researchers, as well as uh, science policy organizations that are run by students we also have the Union of Concerned Scientists who provide seed funding for all different types of programming. And of course, as you're going to hear later, Research America provides microgrants as well. And of course, there are other organizations. I'd recommend Google, but also word of mouth is a great way to find out about these. Okay, administrators are so important, I gave them their own slide because really without them, you're going to have a very hard time. You should build relationships with your administrators because they have access to funds. Generally, they're the ones who are processing reimbursements and generating purchase orders for you. Uh, they have access to advertising in that they often are in control of university listservs as well as any newsletters that go out to all of the students. Uh, they generally control any TV advertisements that are done in university buildings. Many times they are the ones who have access to facilities for room reservations. Students usually don't have access to this at all. And so anytime you wanna reserve a room, you have to go through an administrator. Having a good relationship with that administrator is therefore key to making sure that you get the room before somebody else does. And of course, most importantly, they have access to institutional knowledge. Many of them have been at the university for a long time. They know everybody, they know how everything works. They know what vendors are in network and which ones are going to take three months to get reimbursed. They know when all the different courses reserve the classrooms. Uh, they know all of the different funding opportunities in the departments and programs. And of course, they know the right people to help you get anything done and can save you a tremendous amount of time and energy st uh, spent barking up the wrong tree. Okay, so the final thing that I wanted to go over, and I don't have enough time to do a lot of detail here, but it's something I think is super important when you're thinking about starting a science policy group, is how to make these organizations sustainable and community based. So just a brief overview, and I actually put together a handout that I think you guys are going to be getting after this panel is over. Um, but basically, there are four main categories that you should think about. One of them is following the mission. So once you figure out what that is, you should put a lot of thought into it and then use that to guide all of your decision making. Uh, 
Um, importantly, every time you're thinking, should we do this event? Should we put together this program? You need to think about how is this gonna be valuable for our members? And think about how to maximize that value uh, without focusing on all of your other priorities first. If you can do these other things while adding value for your members, great. But that should be your number one priority. If you don't do that, then you're not gonna end up attracting the type of people that you want to have in your organization. The second one, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is uh, develop leaders. Don't just do this when you're about to graduate. Don't just do this when uh, you suddenly need a whole bunch of people and you have like a power vacuum. You should be doing this all the time. Uh, and the reason for that is because you can do great stuff by yourself, but if you really wanna like go the distance and make an impact, you need to build a team of people who can support each other. And there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, the handout goes into more detail, but basically you want to uh, identify people early on and always be looking for ways to help continue to develop their skills. The third one is to cultivate social networks. So work feels a lot less like work when you're doing it with people that you like spending time with. Um, and this has really helped us a lot in the organization that I run. Um, and we've done this through incorporating social programming throughout all of the rest of the programming that we do. So happy hours, trips to Six Flags, haunted houses, uh, things like that. Just opportunities for people to get to know each other in a more social way can really strengthen the bonds between the members of your group. And then the fourth one, of course, is building a resilient and sustainable organization and embracing the complexity of human experience. People are gonna have mental health uh, things that come up. They're going to have personal obligations where they have to step back for a minute. And it's important that you plan for stuff like that to happen so that nobody feels like they have to choose between doing what they need to do for themselves and letting down the entire organization. Um, and so all of these considerations are things that we're going to cover a lot at the um, NSPN chapter support committee, which is starting now in NSPN. We'll be talking about all these types of issues as well as providing specific training in the details of running an organization, like what are the rules about lobbying and should I form an independent nonprofit, um, as well as networking and peer support with other group leaders from around the country. So with that, I think that's it. Thank you, Erin. What a fabulous presentation. And, you know, obviously you hit all the key points in terms of early career science policy work, but I actually think your presentation would be relevant to the management, the, <laughs> the, the, the beginning and management of any type of nonprofit. I mean, really, mm. um, just kudos to you. And it just Thanks. shows that, um, you know, how much folks are capable of while they're also getting their PhDs, but really, <laughs> really terrific um, presentation. Thank you. Um, so let's see, do we already have some questions? Um, we do. Yes, we do. All right, let's see, Tyler from the University of Nebraska. Um, depending upon the size of the audience or the format of the talk, do you tend to pay an honorarium to individuals that sit on an oral panel? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so it depends. It depends uh, primarily on whether we have funds already. If we don't, then we'll try to make it work without. Um, if we do, we try to give honoraria to everybody, at least a little bit, but we would change the size of the honorarium. So if it's a panel that all the panelists had to put a lot of time and planning into, we try to give them um, $100 for their time. But if it's something that they didn't have to put a ton of time into, they're just talking about their own experience and maybe they didn't have to put together a presentation, $50 is uh, something that we would probably consider. But it primarily depends on whether we have funds available or not. Um. <clears throat> Kristen has a great question. Um, do you have any suggestions on retaining people in the Zoom era? Our university saw a real downturn after we stopped offering free food uh, <laughs> and meeting in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that definitely happened to us as well. It was quite a transition. Our organization now, one year after COVID, is uh, it's definitely different. Um, some of the same faces, but the type of ways that we interact with each other is really different now. Um, so 
As I mentioned, free food is a great way to get people to come to your events. But as we learned also when COVID happened, um, if you stop having free food for some reason, then you find out that a lot of the people were only there for the food in the first place, <laughs> not so much for the rest of the content. Um, so I think that maybe free food sort of artificially inflates the number of people who you think are interested in your programming. And it can be really demoralizing to see them just sort of vanish. Um, so in terms of retention, I think that some of the key points with that are um, some of the things that I went over in the final slide, which is making sure that what you're offering is still what people are looking for, and that can change. And so it's important to check in with them and ask them what is valuable to you right now. Is it having a supportive community where you feel like you are safe and you can talk about the things that you're struggling with and maybe has a little bit less to do with science policy right now? Um, or is it that you want something you can put on your CV because you are about to graduate and you just feel like you need to have things to check off on a, a list so that you can feel comfortable with your impending graduation? Um, so that's really important. The other component is that even if you are doing a lot of programming and it's all really applied, um, I really highly recommend that you incorporate social programming into what you do. So we have started doing uh, monthly general meetings where the first half is business. We give updates, we have recruitment opportunities, we talk about the work that we're doing, but then the second half we have um, suggested discussion topics and some of them are always there like venting about uncertainty with your career trajectory and then some of them that change every month are based on stuff that's happening in the news. So in January we had many different discussions about the policy implications of uh, deplatforming the sitting president of the United States off of Twitter and, and other social media platforms. That has a lot of policy implications. So we had a lot of people who spent an hour or two in those breakout rooms talking about those issues because they don't have a lot of other friends in science who think about this stuff, who care about this stuff. And that has helped a lot with people sticking around, even when burnout is sort of a an epidemic amongst people right now when um, Zoom fatigue is really hard. Having personal connections and personal relationships, I think, has really helped to sustain people's involvement mm -hmm. over time. Terrific. Um, one last question, Erin. Um, we hear from our micro grantees from time to time that they're really not getting support from their PIs. In some cases, my PI doesn't even know I got this grant and I don't want to tell them. Um, what have you found and what has NSPN found in terms of really cultivating support from, um, from PIs and, and other folks on the, on the academic side who, you know, really control a lot of, you know, your time? Yeah, yeah, that's tricky. And so much of it depends on the PI and on the university. Um, one thing that I have found that seems to help is um, sort of talking about science policy in a way that they can understand a little bit more. So even if the reason that you are writing a policy memo is because there's an issue that you're really passionate about, that you think uh, people in your state legislature need to be doing something about, and that's what drove you to research it and write the memo and put it together and meet with your representatives, um, that might not be how your PI understands it. But if you submit that memo to the NSPN and JSPG memo writing competition and it gets published, that's published. PIs understand what that means. Mm -hmm. So if you can say, oh, I wrote this memo and it's been published and here it is, that carries a lot of weight with them. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, oh, we got a grant for this or this was published or there's some sort of external validation that they can understand can help them to see that this isn't just a hobby. This is a, a dynamic ecosystem of people and organizations who are working on this topic. Even if they don't understand it, they can sort of see where you're coming from. That is a great, um, the, the point about external validation, I think is also great for groups like Research America who are providing the support and what else can we provide to help um, early career scientists move through this. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. Really, sure. really fabulous. Um, Thank you. And again, everybody will have access to the slides. So now we're going to actually hear from 
two of Research America's uh, grantees. Um, we're first gonna hear from Julia Leffler and Dan McCauley from the Medical University of South Carolina. South Carolina, yeah. And um, I believe you guys are a new um, science policy group, right? That's correct. Yeah, so you're gonna talk to us about what it was like to get going and what you've been working on. Um, and then we'll hear from Joanne Lee of University of California at Irvine, who um, pulled together a very interesting uh, project. Um, so take it away, Julia and Dan. Alrighty. Uh, so uh, as introduced, we're Julia and Dan, and we're from the Medical University of South Carolina. And today we'll be talking about how we built our own um, little network of politically engaged scientists um, at MUSC. And, um, uh, and we'll be representing the group that we call SC PAIR, which stands for Policy, Engagement, Advocacy, and Research. And so our group started um, really as an idea that was pitched by Dr. Diana Fulmer, shown on the very bottom of the screen, um, all the way back in about 2018, where she really just sent out a mass email blast to the students that she knew at MUSC and asked if anyone was interested in thinking more about science policy. Um, and then so following that, kind of this informal group, Julia and I included, of course, uh, got together to think more about how we can make science policy maybe a, a more formal group at MUSC or really start taking some action. Um, but unfortunately, as that was kind of getting underway, COVID-19 hit, um, Diana became Dr. Fulmer as she graduated and interest in our group really just kind of tended to wane. But Julia and I were, you know, kind of, as we talked about in the last presentation, uh, friends and kind of constantly talking about policy. And so we thought we would try to revive the group by applying for this Research America grant. And so today, um, you know, we're here in 2021 and we've launched a couple of events. We've grown our group now from just the two of us to about 20 people. So we're really excited about that. Um, and one of the first things that was really important to us uh, that we realized early on is that both of us being PhD students and especially um, both of us being fifth year students, we needed to delegate tasks and create some subcommittees to help split things up. And so the first one that we decided we would build is a communication subcommittee um, to deal with uh, science policy writing a little bit and bringing in speakers and things like that. And then the next one we wanted to put together was a diversity and inclusion subcommittee, um, which helped us put together a number of events in that domain. Uh, we also wanted to have a group of people um, really just dedicated to logistics and event planning. And then lastly, we wanted to have a group of people reaching out to other existing groups within the community and looking at how we can build partnerships and find opportunities um, in Charleston, South Carolina. So in trying to figure out um, the organization of this group, we also wanted to think about how we wanted to actually plan out these events that we had planned um, that we had, you know, suggested and talked about um, throughout the year. And so we organized um, a kind of a loose calendar of like how we wanted to um, actually carry out these tasks, dedicating specific times to um, uh, the events that we wanted to do. So January and February, we wanted to um, bring in speakers um, that actually are involved in science policy to have our members actually learn more about what that actually looks like. We then wanted to dedicate um, the spring to diversity series, um, working with other groups on campus, um, really trying to educate ourselves on the, like how scientists can make a change um, and get more involved with social justice issues as well. We then dedicated uh, this May-June timeline to an event that we'll go into detail later um, called Lab to Leaders, Science Doesn't Have to be Lost in Translation. And then this summer, we um, are planning on doing more community partnerships. And then throughout the year, we um, really had this um, science policy writing series that we wanted to uh, dedicate time to. And uh, for the remainder of this presentation, we're gonna focus on this Lab to Leaders event and the science policy writing series. 
So our Lab to Leaders event came out of this idea that many people in a, the Charleston community doesn't really know what type of research goes on at MUSC. Um, we are a smaller university. And on the flip side, we wanted to create a space for um, graduate students to be able to uh, practice talking about their research to people who aren't involved in the sciences, um, really focusing on, you know, not the nitty gritty aspects of, you know, a signaling pathway that they work on, but making it relevant to uh, the people in the community and why uh, they should care about science. And so we created this virtual commun uh, science communication competition asking participants to create a poster detailing why and how their work is important for um, public policy um, more locally. Uh, the goal was to make research more accessible, practice science communication skills, and engage with the community outside the bench. Uh, to Dan and I's surprise, we got um, a pretty good participation, uh, 15 participants and four judges, three um, being not so much in the science background, but a more communications background, and one research postdoc to judge the event. Um, and pictured here are just some example um, winning posters from the competition itself. All in all, we got really favorable uh, feedback from this event. And one thing that we wanted to do after this event was done was send out a poll, um, really getting feedback from the participants and other people who uh, were engaged in this event. Um, the three questions or the four um, statements we had them try and respond to is one, uh, this event was good practice for developing my scientific communication skills. Two, I learned about my colleagues research through this event. Three, I would participate in this event again. And four, this event made me more interested in science policy careers. And overall, um, we had you know, about 92% in agreement that this event was good for developing communication skills, 92% agreement that, learned, that they learned more about their colleagues' research through this event, 92% um, agreement that they would participate in this event again, and then 53% in agreement that uh, this event made them more interested in science policy careers. And while the statistic is a little bit lower than the rest of the statements, um, this kind of so it was still encouraging to us in that over half of uh, people who may not have even known what a science policy career could even look like, um, you know, this event did increase um, that interest. And moving forward, we can really uh, take this feedback and make this um, uh, really improve on this event um, in the coming years. And so the other uh, series that we wanted to highlight today was our science policy writing series. Uh, and one thing we learned from participating in this series was that it was really useful for us to leverage existing resources within our university. And so the image that we're showing here um, is an article that was published by um, Janice Glover, who you'll hear more about today, uh, one of our, our leaders within our group, uh, who published an article about being uh, a Black woman in STEM and the unique challenges that it presents. Um, and Julia also um, published an article about uh, the leadership gap for women in STEM. And then I myself uh, followed up in the, in the summer in publishing an article about blood donation policy and FDA policy for uh, queer men. And so all of this was leveraged, um, so to speak, by publishing through our existing uh, MUSC blog for graduate students. Uh, and so we reached out to the blog director and we were able to kind of develop these more politically themed articles. And so you're welcome to go to that website and see more. Um, but the second thing we learned about writing uh, or within our policy writing series was how valuable it is to reach out to the community. And so if you remember back to the beginning of the presentation, we actually dedicated a whole sub -community, uh, subcommittee to community outreach. And Janice Glover shown here was really in charge of that effort. And one place that she really struck gold with was when she reached out to the South Carolina Aquarium, um, wherein she was just kind of asking for volunteer opportunities and things like that. Uh, and what they had responded to her about was that they were looking for help uh, specifically in doing some research about how FEMA's hurricane disaster relief policies in South Carolina uh, disproportionately impact the native Gullah Geechee people. And so Janice really put together this beautiful data on the subject 
Um, and all of this was forwarded, of course, to the South Carolina Aquarium. And it ended up being published uh, as an op-ed in The Hill um, nationally under the title, FEMA Don't Drive the Gullah Geechee from Their Land. And we were really, really thrilled and proud that Janice was mentioned in the article um, and that our group got a little shout out there as well. So just to wrap up, um, we kind of put together our tips um, for starting a science policy group um, after this journey that we went on um, under the microgrant. Um, the first, really building a team of motivated people and learning to delegate. So many of the events that we planned throughout the year could not have happened without um, really motivated people that um, were excited about participating in this kind of work. Uh, two, leveraging your existing resources within the university. Again, advertising through other groups, um, making those connections. Three, taking the initiative to reach out to other local, state, and national organizations. And with that, we'd like to really acknowledge uh, the rest of SC Pair and our steering committee, um, support from our administration and Research America. Um, with that, we'll take any questions. Thanks. Terrific, Julia and Dan. Wow, you really did a lot with your micro grant. Um, we're just very proud of your work and uh, just so thrilled um, that we had a chance to support you. Um, Questions. I know it's getting late in the day, um, but we still have a lot of folks on. Um, did you encounter any issues with your administration in terms of one, delays in receiving your grant money um, or um, pushback from any of your scientific advisors? Yes, we did have some issues in terms of figuring out the grant money um, with our administration. That was kind of the probably our biggest um, roadblock in all of this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know um, we we've, we've heard that from several um, more so this past year than 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 in other years. But um, we're going to start working with those administrators early on um, so um, you can get the get the funds faster. Um, One um, kind of science policy spirit sort of, uh, I guess, consequence of having trouble with our administration was that a lot of our trouble was that the existing university policy is that students would make a purchase themselves and then be reimbursed. Um, and we realized that we had a lot of large purchases and uh, grad students don't make much money. <laughs> so <laughs> we reached out to the university about getting around this policy and potentially changing it. Um, and I don't know if it's gone into effect yet, but it seems like they are interested in, in changing the policy simply because they didn't know how it was impacting graduate students. See there, you've already impacted policy on your own <laughs> exactly. campus. It's small so, but... so that's great. Um, how have you determined leadership roles? Has that just kind of fallen into place? Have you had an election or have you surveyed folks? How has that worked? I don't know, Dan, if you want to take this, but yeah. I mean, D Dan and I, you know, when we started this, we kind of decided that we would be co-leaders and mm -hmm. a lot of the rest of the organization was us getting input from other people who were interested and delegating that way. Um, Dan, if you want to say more. Yeah. I mean, I would just say that what we heard in the last presentation from Aaron was really true. The people who came forward wanting to be leaders in the group, I, I don't think we ever had um, any doubts about it because they seemed so motivated and interested and really were, you know, the right people at the right time for us. It's fabulous. Well, um, we're getting near the end of this whole session. So I think we'll wrap up the Q&A. But again, thank you so much. And I know uh, I don't know this for sure, but I'm assuming you'd be willing to act as resources for folks um, from other universities. So um, yeah. great. All right, thank you so much. Um, our last speaker is Joanne Lee of the University of California at Irvine. And uh, Joanne is gonna talk about her micro grant um, and also I think how they really made good use of um, working virtually um, in terms of uh, 
developing data uh, communication skills. So Joanne, take it away. Um, thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you again for uh, Sophia for inviting me to participate in this talk. Uh, my name is Joanne. I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine in the biomedical engineering department. And in my free time, I get to do a lot of multimedia work with the graduate professional success for STEM students here at UCI. And we were very much blessed with getting the micro grant from Research America. So thank you so much for being able to support and give us an opportunity. So the workshop that we built then from there is Beyond the Bench, visualizing and communicating data to, public, uh, to the public and policymakers. Um, and this really stemmed from sort of two specific groups within GPS STEM, and I can explain a little bit more. But the first thing I do want to address though is why I, as scientists should we care um, about data visualization and communicating beyond just our fellow researchers. And if we think about our scientists and the work that we do, um, sort of the depth of research goes very far down and it goes farther and farther and farther and farther. Um, quite far in terms of where it goes, but at the end of the day, it's kind of the question of who gets to see this and what medium does that come in? And so the flavors that we typically have for communication mediums is these peer-reviewed journal articles and these technical reports of methodological details kind of skips out on a lot of the social media and media interviews, blog posts, and things that often, if you look on a reverse type of scale here, uh, is the size of audience. And so when you sort of start to think about who you're reaching with your research and what you work so hard on as PhD students, it kind of comes down to the question of, you know, are you making the impact that you're looking for and does it matter to you? Um, and so looking at these other avenues of communication for social media, um, specifically the data visualization, web feature, blog posts, they certainly are something as sort of an alternative for your research to stand out. And so the question of why should scientists care, I want to reverse that to why should everyone else care about your research and the hard work that you've done. Um, and so being able to then have a platform or an alternative to those very difficult um, publications that are not always easy for everyone to understand. Data visualization allows for us to be able to communicate simple, interesting, and most importantly, memorable type of research for everyone. Um, and really the TLDR there is that to make your research, your science, the things that really matter to you matter to everyone else. Um, so this team then that came together with this micro grant, we were introduced to this grant from our our director, Harinder Singh um, of GPS Bio, oh, sorry, we were GPS Bio prior, uh, GPS STEM now. Um, and it really comes from the two sort of houses. One is Art and Science, which is where I come from. So I've done a lot of multimedia work and just my first love was art, but here I am as an engineer, as a PhD student. And then our second group uh, from the career cohorts is data science. And sort of we found a happy middle in the between for this micro grant uh, between the two organizations. So from there, we built a four part webinar series. Uh, thank goodness that everything was online because this actually made it a lot easier to grab our facilitators and our workshop leaders. Um, and we tasked the overall group who participated, which was about 16 individuals. Noted these are PhDs who have to take care of their, their research work as well as sort of this co competition that we built up. Um, we tasked them with creating an infograph. And so of the four part series, what we had them do um, is that in our first workshop, featured by William Angel. Uh, we talked about collecting, preparing, and data and processing data. So really we're looking to find something interesting, uh, getting the data collection, where to find it, how to find it, what do you do with the data afterwards, and how do you know what the data is sort of, is it the best one to work with, or should you continue to move on? Should you combine other ones? Um, then we do the pre-processing, so simple methods for people who don't really know too much about coding to be able to get started or at least know a little bit, can do a little bit more 
with cleaning up the data as well as getting it to a point where you can start looking at what's interesting. And then finally getting to our hypothesis crafting. So let's say you, you know, have something that's interesting that you see and you want to build a hypothesis there you do your data analysis and as every scientist says you have to go back and do it all over again if it doesn't prove correct um, so really just teaching that scientific method for data science at a very fundamental level for our workshop one then our workshop two we went into numbers and visualization, um, moving those numbers then into some type of image, if you will, with Raman. Uh, he is also an illustrator and scientific communicator with his PhD. Um, so we're here to make something beautiful, something eye-catching and something that makes people want to go, oh, what is that? How can I learn more and what can I see more of? So here we're looking at graphic design fundamentals, so the fonts, the formatting, the things that you don't realize when you're looking at good graphic design, but you realize when you're looking at really bad graphic design. Um, accommodating color palettes. So we do have individuals who are colorblind and being able to accommodate for that. And then the Illustrator basics, as well as any other software basics uh, for individuals to get started. So that's our workshop number two. And then our third and last workshop, um, is your communicating work to the policymakers and the public. And that was with John Schwabes. He works as a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. And this is kind of his bread and butter. He's written two books about communicating your sciences and the fundamentals of design. Um, here, we're really looking at ways to share your work, the blogs, social medias, websites, et cetera, um, as well as reaching out to your Congress and local representatives representatives, the forums, and being able to speak to individuals, um, building and creating captivating titles so that people will want to click into them and to learn more, and the strategy of how to get to that point. So when should you launch, even if you have your data five months in advance and something beautiful. So the timeliness of when you launch a campaign with your art and uh, this infographic that you have that can be very strategic or it could be as lackadaisical and loose as I have this published it's really cool and I really want to get it out um, and finally some to do's or not to do's uh, so really comprehensive in terms of the step one step two step three from bringing data raw data to an illustration and then getting it to a point of communicating to your uh, audience and then finally we did our competition and our competition was our last webinar for our workshop series um, where our individuals got to present what they made. So throughout the whole four weeks that we were having this, um, we provided them data sets where it was two different data sets of two flavors. One was Break Free from Plastic from Sarah Suave and then PhD awarded by Field for the NSF Foundation. Um, we, we were considering whether we should do COVID since it was during that time, um, but we kind of figured everyone was kind of tired of hearing all the COVID stuff, so we wanted to shift away from that and give them a different opportunity, but by all means, they were encouraged to utilize the uh, data sets here for the competition, but they were allowed to bring in additional resources if they felt like it was necessary. And if it, they felt like it was within their means of their time, again, this is a very fundamentals course that we want to build so that people could learn and get their feet wet, but they could take it as far as they wanted to, or just do the fundamentals within their, their time. So with that, we had our teams broken up into two to four people. Their goal was to create an infographic from the data set, build their hypothesis, and then be able to communicate that at our webinar number four. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, at that webinar number four, they are doing five to seven minutes of presenting their work to the judges. So I'm going to go ahead then to show you guys some of the resulting uh, posters that were created. I know this is a little bit difficult to, to look at because it's quite small. So again, graphic design, ensuring that your audience can see. So blowing up the images here. So looking at this is created by Ravindra, Jasmine, and Shui. And they're really focusing on the message of simplifying plastic recycling. Um, I do have a video of 
them talking about their work, but I'll go ahead and save it for now just in case we run out of time and I can show that at the end. Um, but this is their top part where they were able to then visualize the amount of, of um, plastics of certain categories and then sort of their TLDR, their take home message of policy recommendations is, we see how many different types of plastics there are, how can we simplify this and suggestions of moving forward of going in that direction. Now, the interesting part about this and the interesting part about having, um, uh, having, I guess, the same data set, sorry, I just want to check the chat in case someone says something, is that you can have the same data set have totally different eyes on it and come up with a totally different hypothesis and statement from it. And so here we're really looking more towards the company and the business aspects where different companies have different sort of plastic legacies. Um, here on the very right, we have the 400 year degradation of Coca-Cola and Pepsi versus the 30 years of Nestle. And so their recommendation, Jesse and Natalie's here, is to incentivize companies to be able to produce more readily degradable plastic as a means to be able to now, you know, address this plastic overuse. Um, so with those two, then we have uh, the other data set with the and with the PhD field fundings here, this is made by Kate Lawson, Kate uh, Sormas, and Mara Burns. Um, here they looked at more computer science PhDs and they had a plethora of different types of fields that were included in that uh, data set, but they specifically chose to look at computer science and really were rallying for opportunities for NSF funding for comp, comp sci PhD students here. Um, and then the other one, again, same data set, different type of you know, information that we're getting from that data set. This is by Chris and Xiao Jie, um, really looking at different opportunities for PhDs, uh, depending on your career. So you know, if you're looking for uh, a career in education, does it make sense for you to go for that PhD or, or ED? Um, and so education administration specifically, so looking at ways to restructure um, the differences of these two programs and ensure that the programs and their fundings are going in the right direction. So although these sort of scratch the surface of these policy making um, aspects, but being able to now uh, move forward with what we've learned here, really looking at future iterations. So having a much more complex product. And um, if we had more time, it's really difficult to ask PhD students for their time, um, but really emphasizing that policy aspect. So that would be like a level two area where we have more complex product and, or we really focus on, okay, you have your product. How do we build a good policy memo? How do we build something that can now touch beyond what you have here? Um, I know, again, asking students to look at uh, data sets outside of their thesis is kind of, uh, it's a good training wheel, but at the same time, what could be made even more relevant to them is their data that they're utilizing and how they can uh, make that into something that they can uh, be a, they can spearhead and showcase to the public. And then lastly, taking all the resources here that we've created now and be able to use that in a reverse classroom training setting. And overall, we've had very positive feedback, asking for more of strong interest in the gra graphic design aspects, which we've actually done prior, very extensive four week period of more graphic design work, um, but just other things to explore. So as I wrap up here, then um, I just want to show what the sort of uh, more complex products can look like in use. So I'm just going ahead and exit out of my PowerPoint there. So this is the, uh, I think the 2013 budget proposal for the Obama administration. Um, here, you know, you can glide your mouse over and see, just visually see where there was an increase of uh, spending and then decrease of spending just purely by the colors. Um, and then you can also just do different ways of reorganizing very complex, a lot of information um, into sort of these other graphs that become more palatable for people who may not be in the crux of what this looks like. So in the project proposal, a lot of it was in health and human services. 
Um, and very clearly you can see that from just scrolling through here. So this would be like a very complex level beyond it, but definitely something of interest. Um, another example here for those Disney lovers uh, looking at the number of dialogue broken down by gender. So again, making um, different ways for us to be able to uh, visualize this. So here, men in blue, women in red. And again, I'm just going to go through this very quickly and I can wrap up after this as ways to be able to integrate more information into what you're trying to create. So um, here, I'll go ahead and wrap up then. I should do this instead. And it did not take me back where I want it to go. So I will go back to here. Other ways that you can do your um, chats, podcasting, GPS Dem Radio was one that I got to start with. Saipal Soundbites for JSPG. You can also publish your work with JSPG, Journal of Science of Policy and Governments. And they um, are there to, they actually allow you to insert an image too, if you want to pair that. Um, and then lastly, just thanking the coordinating team, Harinder, Remy, and Chris, um, as well as our workshop facilitators, William, Raman, and Jonathan. And lastly, thanks to our judges for joining us that day. Sophia, who was with us, Dr. Fruman, um, and Adriana Bankston from JSPG. So that's all that I had with our sponsorship. Um, I do want to leave you all with a quote, and you've heard, you've heard a lot of inspiration here. Words may inspire, but only action cha creates change. So go out there and do what you will with your time, power, and energy. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. I mean, what a great example of a skill building um, project. You know, Aaron talked about the different types of activities and science policy groups can do, and what a fabulous example of skill building um, and a skill set that's being increasingly used. So um, I think we'll, we'll s stop and not do questions because I want to give folks a little breather before the five o'clock mentoring session. Um, look out uh, in August for an announcement of our next round of microgrant funding. Uh, we'll make sure to send it to everyone who's registered for the conference. Um, it'll be on our website. Um, and wow, this was just great. So much food for thought and uh, really appreciate not only your time today, but all the good work that you're doing. And those of you who stuck with us um, until, they, until the very end. Thank you so much.